for Americans, there is one superb subject for literature which hardly any other nation possesses. It's very difficult, indeed, I think impossible, to cover it all in a single book. It's ample enough and various enough to inspire dozens of different books, some comic and some pathetic, some coldly factual and some warmly fanciful. And it's a subject which will not be exhausted for many years yet. The theme is the life of immigrants and their families, the people who pulled up their roots in the old world and came overseas to put them down in new ground, drawing up new energy through them and nearly always producing new offshoots, which surprised even themselves. It touches all of us, this theme, for we are all immigrants, or the descendants of immigrants. Yes, all. Even the American Indians are immigrants, for it seems perfectly clear that they entered this continent from Asia in not very distant prehistoric times. Once you've grasped this fact, it alters your whole view of the Indians. I remember well, I first realized its truth when I was watching a rodeo in the Crow Indian Territory of southern Montana. Our party of four were the only white people present. All the competitors and the judges and the spectators were Indians. Well, in an abstract sort of way, I already knew about the ethnological link between the American Indians and certain peoples of Central Asia, but it was only when I sat there and looked all around at the broad, flat faces, the opaque black eyes, the straight black hair, the strong bones with a firm layer of fat over them, the weathered uh, brown and russet skin, the heavily skirted women and the swaddled children and the powerful old men, the tents pitched in the camping ground and the dried meat hanging in strips near them, it was only then that I understood actively that these were transplanted Asians and that their closest living relatives were the nomads of the Great Plains in and beyond Mongolia. Yes, we are all immigrants or the descendants of immigrants, but the adventure of immigration has been so very varied that it cannot possibly be brought into the compass of a single book or even a single bookshelf. Consider the different fates that led us here. Most of us, or our ancestors, came willingly and gladly. They loved the new land of freedom and couldn't be kept away from it. But one-tenth of our population, at least, is made up of the descendants of unwilling immigrants, the Negroes, who were brought here by force in chains. And a fair number of early white settlers were brought here, more or less involuntarily, transported for such trivial offences as stealing a silk handkerchief or sold into apprenticeship when they were too young to have much say in the matter. <laughs> I remember a friend of mine spent some time studying the passenger lists of the ships which came out to the British colonies in America and tracing the backgrounds of the men and women in them. The most amusing and pathetic consignment was simply described as four sweet singers, evidently a quartet which had failed to get enough good engagements at home and determined or was obliged to seek a different fortune in the new world. No, it could not be written as a single story, but it is enthralling for us to read the various episodes in it, even if they cannot be unified. Some of the most poignant works in American literature deal with them, and some of the lightest. The adventures of recent immigrants and their children made the theme of Aby's Irish Rose, which ran for an unheard of time on the New York stage, and of I Remember Mama, which may still be running in one form or another. Huge sociological studies have been written about immigrants, and they have been worked over by anthropologists, penologists, historians, and almost every kind of specialist. One of the driest but saddest books I've read for some time is a study of the German and Austrian scholars who came over to the United States during the era of Hitler. It's called The Refugee Intellectual by D.P. Kent, published in 1953 by Columbia University Press. It's got a good four-page bibliography which would start a reading program for anyone interested in the subject. Fiction and non-fiction, and autobiography, which is somewhere between the two, can all be made out of the adventures of the immigrant. Although it's impossible to make one story out of it, still we do see certain broad patterns which emerge in the lives of most immigrants, certain recurring experiences and problems. First and most important is that the vast majority of them feel a sense of expansion and freedom. Not all, no, some are terrified by the power and vastness of America and shrink into themselves. Some are too old to transplant and never grow any further. But many original immigrants and the children of nearly all grow bigger in body and expand in spirit. They feel as though, as though barriers had been broken down, walls pushed back, the ceiling lifted almost as high as the sky. Yes, sometimes they are dissatisfied and want still more walls broken and the roof lifted still higher, but 
they will usually admit that they have experienced a wonderful liberation. There's a touching little incident illustrating this in the Swedish author Wilhelm Moberg's book Unto a Good Land, that's Simon and Schuster. It tells of a small group of Swedes leaving their own famine-stricken country and entering the United States. One of them is a girl who had been miserably abused and downtrodden in the old country. In America, she made a new life for herself. She was clever with her hands. She managed to support herself by sewing and designing dresses. She actually saved money. Then she symbolized her triumph by a very important act. She bought a hat. In Sweden, no such peasant girl could ever wear a hat in those days, a kerchief at most. Hats were for great ladies and the parson's wife. But now, now she was a free woman in a free country, and with magnificent pride, she put on, long envied, and now at last achieved her first hat. Yet, you know, one reason that immigration is so difficult and sets up so many psychical tensions is that often, along with this sense of freedom, the immigrant finds himself confronted by new and unexpected difficulties, so that he's compelled at the same time to exercise fresh powers and to submit to fresh limitations. The chief problem is language. Some immigrants never solve it. Few immigrants, unless they come in very young, ever solve it completely. Moberg expresses this difficulty very well when he says that his Swedish immigrant group, the moment they landed at the battery, felt that they had been struck deaf and dumb. Yes, and partly blind, too. They could talk to no one, they could understand nothing that anyone said to them, and they couldn't read the papers or the street signs. They had become like tiny children. The San Francisco restaurant keeper George Mardikian, who has written a delightful autobiography called Song of America, that's published by McGraw-Hill, tells some amazing stories about this problem as it affected his own group, the Armenian immigrants to the United States. One of his kinsmen, who had spent many years in America, could speak only seven words of English. Seven words. And what were they, you will ask? Well, this character owned a, a street corner flower stand in San Francisco. To every woman who passed, whether she was a pretty girl of 18, a stout middle-aged tourist, or a tottering great-grandmother, he held out a flower, and he uttered his seven words. Quote, Lady, this flower is just like you. From that, he made a good living. Mr. Mardiki and himself did not make the mistake made by some of his fellow Armenians. He studied English hard at every moment he could. And there was a big moment when, after starting as a dishwasher, he got a job as a counterman in a restaurant. And then... <laughs> at night, in his hotel room, he says, he used to practice calling out orders. Vial kutlet, cornad biaf hash, pash ex until the neighbors hammered on the radiator pipes to make him stop. This language problem is aggravated in most families of immigrants by the gap between the parents, thinking in their original language and speaking American English less than perfectly, and the children, thinking in American and speaking it most of the day with their schoolmates. The, the playwright S. N. Behrman, in his autobiographical sketch, The Worcester Account, has recorded how sad it made him to find that after being caught up in school and college, he became unable to talk with his own mother, for she only knew Yiddish, and he had forgotten it entirely. And Kent records that among the refugee families he studied, there were several where the children refused to speak German. Even when their parents addressed them in German, they would answer in English. Of course, you see, that makes an additional complication. The parents would see this as the breakdown of family discipline and object even more strenuously. Yes. That is a serious complication. The children become Americanized much more rapidly than the parents. Although I know that Puerto Ricans are American citizens, I watched the other day with amazement and sympathy when I saw a couple of Puerto Rican women in a bus with their children. The little boys were chatting away with each other in good American, interspersed with a few Spanish phrases. But every now and then they would stop and explain to their mothers in Spanish, kindly, not impertinently, and then rattle away again to each other in English, while their mothers looked at them with large, astonished eyes. In the book by Mr. Kent on the German and Austrian immigrants, there's a touching incident that illustrates the same point. It happened back in the days when Joe Lewis was a leading boxer. A boy, the son of one of these immigrants, was very enthusiastic about an important fight which was approaching, with Joe Lewis as one of the contestants. The book doesn't say which, but I imagine it was one of the two bouts with Schmeling, don't you? Well, on the night of the event, the son wanted to listen to the broadcast. His father, announcing that he did not approve of prize fighting, 
forbade him to listen and forced him to go to bed. The son went to bed but refused to go to sleep until he was sure that the fight was over, even though he couldn't hear it. From his bedroom, he talked to himself in tones loud enough for his father to hear. Down with foreigners. Foreigners are un-American. Poor father, he won that round, but he, he lost the contest. One further difficulty which weighs heavy on most immigrants is the feeling that they are here only on sufferance and that they can never quite hope to become full citizens. Mr. Mardikian says he knew many of his own group who went through all their lives without venturing on the citizenship test. Some of them, he says, some of them had won a reputation in their neighborhood as wise men, yet in their hearts lay the fear that they couldn't answer the questions of the naturalization examiner. This worried Mardikian. When he was preparing for his citizenship examination, he had nightmares in which the examiner asked him questions in some weird language like Chinese, and when he failed, turned thumbs down. Oh, it worries everyone who takes the examination seriously. I remember that my wife and I, when we became citizens, were interviewed by a grave and wise judge who put many searching questions to us, which we answered with beating hearts. At last he turned away from me and fixed his gaze upon my wife. After a painful pause, he said, Can you read and write? She suppressed a gasp and said, Yes, I can. Then he relaxed for the first time with a cheerful and welcoming smile. He said, Yes, I have read your novels. She passed. But for most incomers, ladies and gentlemen, these difficulties are small compared with the achievement of making a new life for themselves and seeing their children grow up with more advantages than they themselves ever had. George Mardikian did better than most. He started with less and ended with more to his credit. He began as a penniless dishwasher, 12 hours a day, six days a week. And at the end of his book, he tells proudly how he was given the Medal of Freedom by President Truman and entertained to dinner at the White House by President Eisenhower. But the most intense moment of his entire career came when he was quite young, just after taking the oath of allegiance as an American citizen. He rode out on the Sutter Street trolley as far as the terminus. He sat on the beach all alone and looked at the Pacific Ocean and felt his new life flowing through him. He says, You who have been born in America, I wish I could make you understand what it is like not to have been an American all your life and then suddenly, with the words of a man in flowing robes, to be one for that moment and forever after. One moment you belong with your fathers to a million dead yesterdays. The next you belong with America to a million unborn tomorrows. We hope you have enjoyed listening to this tape. You may also wish to listen to some of the 94 other titles available in the series. For further information, write to Jeffrey Norton Publishers, 145 East 49th Street, New York, New York, 10017.